around 600 venomous snake species, and you should look out for vipers and cobras. Each has a different type of venom and needs different treatments. If a viper bites you, don't put pressure on your wound. Trapping the venom in one area could make the tissue damage worse. Then you must rush to the nearest hospital for treatment. If a cobra bites someone, you must tie the area with a bandage to stop the venom from going further into their system. Keep an eye on the fellow that was bitten to make sure they're breathing. Yes, cobra venom can paralyze the diaphragm. Don't suck out the venom. It travels so fast into someone's system, you'll achieve nothing. Take a good look at the snake, and if you can, snap a few photos of it to show the medical staff. Try to have good picture composition. Moving on from snakes to allergies. Most people respond to allergens with a runny nose or some sneezing, but others have far more complicated responses. An itchy rash may be a sign of an allergic reaction. It might look like dermatitis, and it can show up a week after your exposure to an allergen. There was a rare case a few years ago. Someone got braces for the first time, and after a week, they developed an itchy rash under their wristwatch and stomach. As it turned out, they were allergic to the nickel in braces. If you get blisters on your skin after sitting in the sun for one to two hours, it's probably not sunburn, but an allergic reaction. You may also have some skin redness, tiny raised bumps, and scaling. When that happens, go to the emergency room fast. Experts will run tests and give you advice on how to continue from there. Sometimes different medications might cause it too, or fruits such as limes and parsnips can. If you're allergic to pollen, stay away from fruits and veggies. Some of them have proteins like the ones found in pollen, and your immune system responds to it as real pollen. They can trigger the same allergy symptoms such as itchiness, swelling of the mouth, face, and, well, you know the gist. You're trapped in a car during a winter storm. Outside it's freezing, and you begin to shiver. That's a good thing. When temperatures drop below a comfortable level, your body starts to shake. This action boosts your body's surface heat production by 500%. But shivering can only warm you up for so long. After a while, your muscles will run out of fuel and they'll stop contracting. If someone suddenly stops shaking and they grow tired and want to fall asleep, act fast. Bring them indoors, remove any wet clothes, rub their hands and feet, wrap them in blankets, and find warm, dry compresses to apply to their chest, neck, or lower tummy. Never put a warm compress on their arms or legs. The sudden heat will force cold blood back to the heart, brains, and lungs, causing the body's core temperature to drop. While you're driving down an empty road, you hear an emergency radio broadcast about the weather. A tornado watch in your area means that a tornado is likely to happen. But a tornado warning means a tornado has appeared on the radar or has been spotted in person. You should also be on the lookout for hail. It appears when updrafts within a thunderstorm push the rain into the thick clouds and it freezes. But when a tornado is approaching, hail can arrive without rain. Then everything gets quiet. The air becomes still and there's no wind. Suddenly, you'll see the clouds moving quickly in a rotating pattern or toward the sky. You'll hear a loud waterfall sound that will turn into a roar as the tornado gets close. It'll be similar to the sound of trains and jets. Debris will begin to fall, and a funnel-shaped cloud will start to rotate, pulling branches and leaves upwards. If the tornado is not moving to either the left or the right, it might be coming toward you, and you won't realize it until it's too close. Take shelter! Just as you're chilling at home watching TV, you hear an eerie whooshing noise. It sounds like a soft gush of wind, but you confirm there's nothing there after checking all the doors. The next day, you feel pressure in your chest, and it gets worse as the week progresses. The chest pains follow with a dreaded feeling of exhaustion. 
you can't help but think there's something wrong with your body. But the problems are within your house. You might have carbon monoxide poisoning. When this gas fills your home, it builds up in your bloodstream and it replaces the oxygen in your body. Poisoning can also cause headaches, nausea, and confusion. In those cases, run outside to get fresh air and call emergency service. Also, get a carbon monoxide detector and add it in the hallway or areas where you sleep. Check the batteries twice a year, and when the alarm goes off, step outside and you know who to call. You go ice skating. The ice on the lake seems thicker than it was, and uh-oh, you hear a cracking snap, and you end up in the icy water. First, your body will go into shock because of the sudden change in temperature. Don't worry, it will pass after one to three minutes. Now, you must find a solid piece of ice and hold on to it. Don't try to climb it. Just put your arms on it, kick your legs, and push the piece forward. It will help you drag your body onto the ice. Once you're on an ice sheet, don't stand up. If you do, your body weight will concentrate on the smaller ice area and it'll break again. Just keep rolling until you're further on the stable ground. What if you have to break the window of a hot car? Car windows have layers of materials that can resist force. Here's what you need to do. Avoid the back windows or the front windshield of the car. They're harder to break. Go for the passenger and driver's side windows. If you've got a hammer, don't hit the glass in the middle. Aim for the edges, where the glass breaks easily. Now, if the windows refuse to break with a hammer, screwdriver, or whatever you've got around, look for a small, pointy rock. If that doesn't work either, then your best bet is your car's spark plug. Pop your hood, pull out the spark plug, break the porcelain casing, and throw the broken ceramic piece anywhere at the window. It's the middle of summer, and you're vacationing somewhere on the Pacific Rim. Suddenly, you feel a strong quake. Well, this could be the first warning sign of an approaching tsunami. Or it could trigger large waves thousands of miles across. But there are other telltale signs that a tsunami is approaching. One is a change in water levels, either rising or falling. If you see the ocean withdrawing quickly and the seabed getting exposed, you should run at least 100 feet above sea level and one mile inland. Many experts say once the seawater starts receding, you've got five minutes to evacuate before the enormous wave hits. Remember, it's all about science and you. Ah, the beauty of nature all around you. The fresh air and days and days of meditative rest far away from civilization ahead of you. But you've been walking for quite some time to get this far, and now it's time to set up camp. The woods around are dense, and there's no suitable place to put up your tent. Then you notice a nice green patch completely devoid of trees and only sprinkled with some low-growing bushes. Well, you go there, smug about your find, and get to work on the tent. The ground is unusually soft and smooth, but that doesn't bother you too much. All the better! The pegs go into the soil like a knife into butter. By the time you're done, it's dark already, so you get inside the tent and crawl into your cozy sleeping bag. You wake up from a creepy feeling that something's not right. You feel wet? You start wriggling inside your bag and, yes, it's almost completely soaked from below. You rush out of the tent as quickly as you can and see that it started to sink into the ground. Turns out you've set up camp on a swamp. And you've been lucky too. Swamps aren't always obvious. Sometimes you won't even see them until you're knee-deep in muck and trouble. Getting out of there can be tricky as well. The moss and roots create a soft padding that's slowly pulling you under. And when you try to raise your feet, you might end up without your boots. Telling a forest swamp is fairly easy when you know what to look for. 
If you're in a dense thicket and see a lush, sunlit glade where nothing but moss and an occasional bush grows, chances are high it's a swamp. You can also check it by stepping lightly on this serene ground. If it feels springy, better stay away. One other thing the swamp can be dangerous for is, surprisingly, a forest fire. If you stay too close to a swamp and start a campfire, it might catch on, especially if there's a strong wind. Swamps and marshes are chock full of tar hidden underneath the layers of water and moss. When it starts to burn, extinguishing it is nearly impossible. Always keep a safe distance from any swamp before starting a campfire. Another common mistake while breaking camp in the wild is not looking up. Let's say you found some solid ground to put up the tent, cleared it from all the nasty cones and stones, and made sure there aren't any anthills close by. You don't want anything to creep inside your sleeping bag at night, do you? The spot you've chosen is perfect, and the tree your tent is leaning to protects you from the wind and rain. You set up for the night, turning off your camping light, and suddenly, your tent is thrashing as if a wild beast has attacked you. Bewildered, you scrambled out and see a huge branch has fallen on top of your tent. The worst thing about this is that you would have seen it coming if only you'd looked up before setting up camp. Half-broken and rotten branches are easy to spot, and it's never a good idea to put your tent straight beneath them. Such a thing can break off at any moment, and you'll be lucky if it doesn't tear your tent and harm you. You know, crunch. Dozens of tourists make this mistake every year and often pay dearly for it. Looking up will also help you make sure there are no wasp nests or spider nets above you. These might prove even worse than a branch because wasps don't like to be disturbed and spiders may turn out to be venomous. Now, if you see a beautiful river and decide to break camp on its banks, pay special attention to where exactly you put up your tent as well. If you stay too close to the water, especially in spring or fall, chances are you'll find yourself afloat in the middle of the night. Always check the weather forecast for the day and the night after. If there's a chance of rain, better stay away from any bodies of water, especially rivers. The rain might raise the water level in it and make it burst its banks, drowning your little camp and ruining your vacation. But even if you're far from water, rain could spoil it for you. Say you're once again deep in the forest and tree crowns are protecting you from the weather. Precipitation still gets to the forest floor, but at least it's not as bad as in the open. The next night, when you set up camp in another place, you feel the ground is soft and springy. It's not a swamp, though, just the last night's rain has loosened the soil. If you're in such a spot, better move to somewhere solid thing is, soft and loose ground might start creeping out from under you at any point. This movement isn't as dangerous as when you're in a swamp, but the pegs of your tent might come loose too, and you'll end up buried underneath a pile of rugs that used to be your tent. And if you decided to set up your camp in a cozy-looking valley, and the rain starts falling when you're already there, well, prepare for a nice floating trip. All the water will naturally go down and into your shelter, eventually finding its way under your tent. No wonder you'll find yourself knee-deep in rainwater when you wake up. Oh, what a great spot for taking a bit of rest after a long walk. It's on a hilltop, so there's no water nearby, the sun's shining, and not a single tree to block it out. Sunbathing here's gotta be fabulous! Well, it seems this way for the first few hours. But when you stay here long enough, you'll see the error of your decision. Direct sunlight on your tent can make it hot in a matter of hours due to the materials it's made of. And you'll feel it on your skin as soon as you crawl inside. Let's just say you won't want to stay in there for long until it's night and the tent's cooled down at least. Same thing with the wind. In an open spot, gusts can reach crazy speeds. And if you haven't been careful while hammering down the pegs, you might say goodbye to your tent sooner than you'd like. It's best to find a spot near a tree that would protect you both from the sun and the wind. Still, don't get tempted to camp near a lone tree when the weather forecast isn't in your favor. Both sunny and rainy weather are okay, but if there's a serious storm coming, a single standing tree will serve as a lightning rod. 
it's not hard to imagine what may come if lightning strikes a tree you're camping under. Hey, you might get a charge out of it! When winter camping, the weather can be even more treacherous. Remember what I said about direct sunlight? Forget it. In winter, it's best to have the sun shining on your tent. The cold might get to you no matter how cool and expensive your tent is, and the winds are generally much more vicious in the cold season. Direct sunlight will help you cope with much of the cold. One of the more common mistakes hikers make is starting a campfire too close to the tent. Again, the material of the tent conducts heat very well, and it's a good thing when it's warm. But it also catches on fire easily. Sometimes, one spark is enough to burn your shelter to cinders. Make sure there's enough room between your tent and the campfire, and never leave your fire unsupervised. When you go to sleep, it's a rule to extinguish the fire so that you don't wake up to a blazing inferno around you. Insects can ruin even the most exciting hike. Mosquitoes, ants, ticks, and other pesky bugs can find their way into your tent wherever you are, so make sure you protect yourself from them. Use skin repellents when you go outside and put an anti-insect spiral next to the entrance to your tent. Don't put it too close or inside, though. The smell is irritating, and it can also cause a fire. To avoid the best part of mosquitoes, and especially ticks, try to stay away from lakes, ponds, and dense forests where swamps may occur. Skeeters reproduce in still water, so areas around such pools are replete with the winged pests. But they have a hard time flying when there's some wind, so choosing an open spot is your best bet to get rid of them. Don't let them bug you! Covered in brown spiky hair with nine pairs of curly arms, the hag moth caterpillar isn't like any other caterpillar. Its hairy appearance has given it the nickname monkey slug. This strange insect can be found in North America, where it lurks through shady trees and ornamental shrubbery. This hairy little creature isn't as innocent as it may appear. The hairs on its back connect to toxic glands within the caterpillar's skin. If you're curious enough to reach out and touch these hairs, your hand will instantly turn bright red and you'll feel a burning, itching sensation, kind of similar to a bee sting. So don't do that! But if you have been stung by the hag moth caterpillar, you should instantly run the sting underwater to remove any insect hairs that may remain. The sting mark should start to heal and be gone in a week. The bullet ant is the largest of all the ant species. Still, despite being the biggest, they grow no larger than the size of a penny. The bullet ant is most likely to be found in countries such as Nicaragua and Paraguay, deep within the rainforests. It might be small, but it has a big bite. The bite of a bullet ant is up to 30 times more painful than the sting of a wasp or a bee. Locals sometimes refer to the small insect as the 24-hour ant, because you'll experience an entire day of discomfort after their bite. Despite the unpleasant feeling, the bite of a bullet ant isn't too dangerous and it should heal within a week. These ants have a particular habit that might make it easy to avoid their powerful bite. Bullet ants release a strong and disgusting stench to drive away predators. So if you ever find yourself trekking through the rainforest and smell an intensely unpleasant odor, hey, I'm sorry. Kissing bugs look similar to your typical cockroach, except slimmer, wingless, and with an interesting line pattern on their back. Even though the name might sound cute, these insects are anything but. The kissing bug can typically be found in the warmer southern states of the US, and these pesky little things will hide anywhere, in cracks, under beds, and in furniture. These insects are nicknamed vampire bugs, as they only come out at night. While their bite doesn't feel too painful, it can be incredibly dangerous. It's common for humans to be allergic to the kissing bug saliva, and if that's the case, their bite will cause the skin to be incredibly itchy. These bugs also carry a dangerous parasite that badly affects most humans. If you ever get bitten by a kissing bug, make sure to visit your doctor as soon as possible. The Japanese hornet is the largest species of hornet in the world. The Japanese hornets have a yellow and black striped pattern. Their size and shape make them distinguishable from bees and wasps. The Japanese hornet is much larger and thinner than a bumblebee, and much longer than a wasp. These hornets, of course, live in Japan. No, not Toledo, where they travel in colonies of up to 700 members. People who have previously been stung by the Japanese hornet liken it to being struck by a red-hot poker. 
If you are ever unlucky enough to be stung by one of these insects, immediately call an ambulance, and while you wait for its arrival, wash the sting with cold water. The black widow spider is one of the most notoriously dangerous insects in the animal kingdom. Roughly the size of a paperclip, the hourglass-shaped red markings on the spider's belly make it easy to distinguish. These bugs often travel alone and can be found in warmer regions in dark, dry shelters such as basements or garages. Black widows are considered the most venomous spiders in North America. Their venom is 15 times stronger than a rattlesnake's. Strangely enough, the bite of a black widow doesn't feel particularly painful. It feels more like a pinprick, but it can make you incredibly sick. If you come across a black widow in your basement, don't irritate it, as they only bite when annoyed. If you get bitten, immediately seek emergency care. Healthcare professionals can offer you a black widow anti-venom that reduces the bite symptoms. The yellow jacket is a dangerous species of wasp that can be found all over the world. They're named for their distinctive yellow and black patterns. The yellow is a striking neon color much brighter than a normal wasp. Yellow jackets live in large colonies and build their nests in trees, bushes, and even underground. If you come across a yellow jacket nest, move away slowly and be careful not to threaten or irritate the wasps. The sting of a yellow jacket definitely isn't a pleasant feeling. While most people think that scorpions are related to crabs and other crustaceans, they're actually a form of insect. Scorpions are a type of arachnid, meaning they are closely related to spiders. They tend to be found in warm, dry climates like deserts. Scorpions most often come out at night. They are predatory creatures known to sting on sight. Their sting feels similar to a wasp's, but it can be much more dangerous. Scorpion stings tend to accelerate heart rates and cause difficulty breathing. If a scorpion stings you, immediately wash out the wound. Contact a healthcare professional who can give you a scorpion sting anti-venom treatment. There are just shy of 300 different species of fire ants all across the world. All of the species have the same powerful bite. They're tiny insects who travel in large colonies and have a distinct light brown color, almost red. Fire ants are most commonly found in the United States and are attracted to food. They tend to crash a lot of picnics they're not invited to. Kind of like my nephews. Fire ant bites are incredibly itchy, but not very dangerous. Running the bites under some cold water should help soothe the itchiness, and the bite should go away in a week or so. If you have a more severe reaction than itchiness, make sure to seek urgent care from your doctor. Honeybees are some of our most beloved insects. They pollinate our flowers, create honey for us to eat, and generally leave humans alone. Honeybees are social insects who live in large colonies. Surprisingly, a sting from a regular honeybee can be extremely dangerous to some people, especially the elderly. If a honeybee stings you, immediately remove the stinger that will be lodged in your skin. Wash the affected area with soap and water. The sting should heal within a week. If you suffer from more severe conditions, you should immediately contact a healthcare professional. Tarantula hawks are long, thin insects with beautiful rust-colored wings and yellow antenna. They tend to be found in rainforests across Asia, America, and Africa. They tend to live alone and make their homes by burrowing into the ground. If you ever come across a tarantula hawk, be sure to move away very slowly. These insects only attack if they sense a threat. Tarantula hawks are thought to have one of the most painful stings in the world. The pain of the tarantula hawk sting is incredibly intense and lasts for 3 to 4 minutes. After these minutes have passed, the sting won't require any urgent care and should heal on its own. The warrior wasp is a peculiar species. Unlike other wasps, the warrior wasp lacks any yellow stripes and is instead fully jet black. So black, they almost look blue. Ooh, ninja! Some people refer to these insects as drumming wasps. When a stranger approaches, the wasps beat their wings in a synchronized fashion, like drummers in a marching band. Warrior wasps prefer warmer climates and can be found in the tropical rainforests of South America. Out of all the species of wasps, the warrior wasp has the most painful sting. The sting doesn't require any emergency medical help and should heal within a week. The Amazonian giant centipede can be found lurking throughout the tropical climates of South America and the Caribbean. With a distinguishable red color, it is the largest species of centipede in the world and can grow up to a foot long. So that's a foot-long bug with 100 feet. Ironic, isn't it?
The giant centipede has a venom dangerous for other insects and smaller animals, but isn't a risk to humans. Despite that, their bite is still unpleasant and causes a burning sensation. If you get bitten by one of these critters, the symptoms can last anywhere from a few hours to a few days. If you have a more serious reaction, you know what to do. Go see the doc. You're up to your neck in cold water. There's ice all around you. You've got to get out! When you're swimming in freezing cold water, your body can get a bit of a shock. Your reflexes might make you want to gasp, but don't. Just do your best to keep your head above water. Throw off any heavy objects like boots, jackets, or backpacks. When you reach some ice, don't just try and jump out. It's not exactly a swimming pool. Try to get into a horizontal position and use your strong legs to swim onto the ice. Use your hands to pull you out. Once you're on the surface, roll away from the edge, then crawl, then walk. If you're venturing into the wild, you may want to get some stuff ready beforehand. Make your own fire starter at home. Heat up some water in a pan, put a Pyrex container in there, and melt some paraffin wax inside it. Then take an egg carton and put some dryer lint in each section. Fill them with paraffin, Wait till it's all solid and cut out each little section. Just one of these little guys will make starting a fire way easier. Dental floss can be super handy for surviving in the wild. You can use it as fishing line with a can tab as a hook. Or you can use it as a clothesline. Just stretch it between two trees. It looks kind of flimsy, but a single strand can hold up to five pounds. It's also quite flammable, so if you're having trouble starting a fire, you can use a few feet of floss to start it up. You can make a seriously strong rope using a simple plastic bottle, if you have a good pair of scissors. Cut off the neck of the bottle so it looks like a tall and narrow cup. Then, start cutting it like some people peel an orange, round and round in a spiral. Try to keep it the same thickness the whole time. It'll be a lot longer and stronger than you're expecting. You can use it to tie sticks together to make a hut, or you can wrap it around your backpack in case it rips or something. Sugar might be damaging for your teeth, but it's got a pretty sweet superpower. Just pour some on a piece of cloth and use it like a Band-Aid. Oh, delicious. Mosquitoes can be a real pain, and there are loads of them around. You can make your own DIY repellent to keep those little guys away. All you need is an orange, a lemon, or any other citrus fruit. They're full of essential oils that mosquitoes can't stand. Peel an orange and rub the peel directly on your skin. Just make sure to crumple it a bit beforehand to help those precious essential oils come out. Another good way to keep the mosquitoes at bay is to add a bit of orange peel to your campfire. That releases the essential oils into the air. You're getting hungry, but you don't have anything to start a fire with. Empty your pockets. There might be something in there that you can use as a makeshift fire starter. If you have a battery and a metal chewing gum wrapper, you're in business. Cut a thin strip of the wrapper, long enough to connect the two sides of the battery. The middle of the strip should be thinner than the ends. Grab some dry grass, twigs, or even some paper, whatever you're going to use to start your fire. The foil strip should ignite right away, so make sure you're ready. A human can go surprisingly long without food, but not water. Depends where you are, but a lot of the time, it might not be safe to drink. You can make a DIY water filter. Start with a fire. Boiling the water may not be enough, so as soon as those ashes are cool, grind them into a powder. Don't just use any ash you randomly found in the forest. It might have some melted plastic on it or something. Then, you need a plastic bottle. Cut off the bottom and poke a small hole in the cap. Turn it upside down, put about 3 inches of charcoal in, and pour the boiled water in nice and slowly. The drips are ready to drink. If you're getting bits of ash in the water, wrap a piece of clean cloth around the cap for some extra filtration. A char cloth can come in handy if you're lost in the wild. To make it, you're going to need a metal container with a cover. Put a piece of cloth inside it and put the container into a fire for a few minutes. The cloth should end up getting a bit black around the edges, but still be intact. A char cloth catches fire super fast, even with an old school flint. 
If you're ever hiking in an anaconda's backyard, listen up. Stay away from shallow rivers because these giant snakes love to hang out there. If an anaconda decides to give you a little squeeze, don't exhale. Every time you do, the snake's gonna squeeze you a little bit tighter. Anacondas do have a weak spot though. They don't like their tail to be bitten. It's not exactly delicious, but it'll get the job done. Avalanches are pretty powerful, so remember these tips next time you're out on the slopes if things get a bit hairy. First off, cover your mouth, use a scarf for some other piece of cloth, and don't let the snow in. Keep one arm straight above your head, and don't forget to dig out a little pocket in front of your face. That'll let you breathe for about a half hour. Get rid of anything heavy you're carrying, even if it's expensive. But make sure you hold onto your backpack. It's an extra layer of protection. And grab onto a tree if you see any. To get back to the surface, move like you're swimming straight up. Snow's just water anyway. If you ever somehow get trapped in a sinking car, don't panic and don't try to open the door. The water pressure from the outside will be too strong. You'll just waste valuable energy and that door just won't open. The best way to escape is through the windows. Roll them down and swim away. If you're not a great swimmer, you can try to create your own makeshift flotation device, like a plastic bag with air trapped inside. Tie a knot in it and make sure it's tight. A plastic bottle would work great, but one probably won't be enough. You can also use a raincoat or a pair of those waterproof pants. You can even use an upside down trash can. If you have some car trouble at night, out in the woods for example, you need light to see what you're doing. All you need is a bottle of water or a jug, or even a pickle jar filled with water. Just strap it on a headlight and voila, the water will spread the light so you can see better. Perfect for setting up an emergency tent or finding wood for a fire. Mason jars, those pickle ones, are really handy when it comes to storing matches. If you're camping in a forest, it's really important to hide those matches away, somewhere dry and safe. To make it even more convenient, make a strikeable lid. Cut off the strips on the side of your matchboxes and glue them to the lid of your mason jar. Before your next big outdoor adventure, make sure you're all stocked up on dark chocolate. Chocolate is probably the most delicious survival food, but it's also one of the best. It's loaded with calories and helps keep your mood up. Plus, you don't need a fork, plate, or fire to prepare it. Last one for today, people. Still having trouble lighting that fire? Look no further than that bag of chips you secretly hid from your fellow campers. Corn-based chips are everywhere these days. And apart from tasting delicious and turning your fingers a weird color, they have one more trick up their sleeve. You can use them to start a fire. These kind of chips are flammable, so make a little mound of chips and keep that dry wood handy. They'll light in seconds. Ah, beautiful. You're walking with your friend and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today, like it has some kind of ring around it, a rainbow type thing. Huh? Hey, look at that. Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly into the stop everything, he says. It's a sun halo. We need to find shelter now, unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you. A sun's halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals flying around 20,000 feet. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage. So, not worth it. Grab some sunglasses, and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts about 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many ways. J-shaped trees means there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into the super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees, unless you have superhuman strength. You're on a nice walk on the beach. 
Sand, sun, not a cloud in the sky. Then, out of nowhere, you see the ocean going back away from the shore. Suddenly, you can even see bits of coral, small fish, and other random small sea animals. That's a good sign to leave. There might be a tsunami on the way. A tsunami is formed when there's an earthquake underwater, and it can hit the coast at 500 miles per hour. It's mostly a Pacific Ocean thing, but why risk it? If there's a channel of choppy water on the beach, stay away. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes, waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange gap in the waves. Or you might notice random bits of seaweed going in all different directions. If you don't ever find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat and don't waste your energy swimming against the current. Yell out for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the channel, swim diagonally to the shore. If you find yourself in the ocean and see a group of sharks swimming, okay, this scenario doesn't sound good either way. Well, the good news is they're not necessarily coming for you. The bad news? The sharks might be trying to escape from a huge tropical storm or even a hurricane. Sharks can sense these things, so when nature gets angry, they group together and swim deep under the surface to get to safety. You probably shouldn't follow them. Good luck! The golden rule since ancient times, follow the animals. Insects, rats, and snakes leave their homes a couple of days before really big earthquakes. Scientists can't track or really explain how they know it's coming. It seems animals really can sense earthquakes, maybe because they feel those smaller initial shock waves that we don't even notice. What if you see animals running towards you? Well, that could mean you're about to get eaten for breakfast. Or it means there's a wildfire behind them. Amphibians like frogs, toads, and salamanders try to protect themselves by burrowing down into the ground. Others just run. Before you start running alongside them, check to see if you can see smoke. You don't want to sprint flat out for nothing. Well, it's not just animals. We can spot warning signs too. For example, if you notice your hair suddenly starts to stand on end and your jewelry starts to buzz, take shelter right away. Lightning might be about to strike somewhere nearby. If you're outside and can't run into a house, make sure not to stand near any tall structures. Lie flat on the ground. Be near water. Seek shelter under an isolated tree or stand in an open space. And don't stand on top of the Empire State Building. That thing gets zapped hundreds of times a year. Do you like skiing? It's all fun and games until all you can see is white. Avalanches can move up to 80 miles an hour, so watch for some warning signs. Does it feel hollow when you walk in the snow? Are there cracks around your feet? Can you see a huge avalanche coming? Time to go! Sometimes a storm mixes its blue light with the red light from the sun, and you get a pretty impressive green. Enjoy it from a safe distance, preferably indoors. This super tall thundercloud usually means you're about to get smashed by hail, or worse, a tornado. Find cover somewhere, like in an underground parking lot or a basement. It might be a bit embarrassing if you're wrong, though. Okay, we know volcanoes can be dangerous, but the lakes near them? Is anything not a sign of danger? Lakes that are near something boiling hot that never cools, so volcanoes, are like wildly shaken soda cans just about to burst. The magma that's underground actually pushes carbon dioxide into the bottom of the lake, and that gas stays there, waiting. Then, even something boring like rain can disturb the lake a little too much and bam! Or boom! <laughs> you get the picture. Diving, swimming, snorkeling, the sea can be amazing, but it's pretty unpredictable. When two wave currents run into each other, they can create a cross sea. It looks pretty cool from far away, but it can be really dangerous for swimmers, surfers, or even ships. There's a strong current roaming around under the surface. You're walking on the beach, apparently every good story starts like this, and all of a sudden, woo, a cave! How cool is this? You should probably go in there, explore a bit, and no. If there's a full moon out, you might not be able to get out of that cave. A full moon affects the tide and makes it lower than usual. 
That cave might be more accessible, but instead of an exciting adventure, you could end up trapped in there until the next full moon. Bring a big lunch. A wall cloud is one of those things you're both excited and scared to see. Scared because you don't know what it is. Excited because, well, how often do you see something like that? Whatever you feel, tell your legs to start running. During a thunderstorm, these wall clouds sit lower than anything else and can be up to 5 miles long. And if they start spinning, well, Dorothy ended up in Oz. Who knows where you'll end up? It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. People have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously. But after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Ooh, creepy. Oh, ocean, come on, not you again. Okay, but just one more. If you see the oceans turned all reddish-brown, don't go in the water or anywhere near it. This red tide is caused by toxic algae and is something you can find all over the world. That toxic algae can be there even if the ocean's a normal color. Getting that stuff all over you can cause some health issues. Rinse yourself off in fresh water as fast as you can. You know, they even wrote a holiday song about it. Algae home for Christmas. No, really. You're walking down the beach toward the water. But something feels different today. The water is bright green, and your nose gets filled with a recognizable pungent stench of rotting eggs. Should you probably come closer to check this unusual phenomenon? Mm Mm-mm. Stop right now until it's too late. What you see is called a harmful algal bloom, also called algae bloom. And approaching it is a very bad idea. This bloom contains algae that can produce dangerous toxic gases, That's what makes previously popular touristy places deserted and outright treacherous. You can come to a sea or lake beach and spot something that looks like blue-green foam floating on or just beneath the surface of the water. Or it may resemble streaks of bright green paint. Some blooms, called red tides, can color the water brown or red. Anyway, once you notice something like that, try to stay away, keep in check that curiosity of yours, and don't go exploring. When algae decompose, pockets of toxic hydrogen sulfide gas are trapped under the crust. If you unknowingly step on such a pocket, you'll set the gas free and can accidentally inhale it. It's enough to say that this is likely to end tragically. On some beaches, bulldozers pile up the algae into dump trucks and bring it to special centers. There, workers dry the seaweed and get rid of it. But sometimes, these centers have to be temporarily closed. Algae mixed with sand and mud smell so awful that local people can't sleep at night because of the stench. There are three types of dangerous algae that can gather into harmful algal blooms. Cyanobacteria, dinoflagellates, and diatoms. All of them are made up of minuscule floating life forms that use sunlight to create their own food. The blue-green algal blooms are caused by cyanobacteria. They produce dangerous toxins that destroy nerve tissue. It can get so bad that water treatment plants might be unable to get rid of the toxin. Then, local people are recommended not to use tap water. Dinoflagellates and one diatom species are responsible for creating red tides. They occur mostly in ocean bays. For a red algal bloom to form, the water has to be warm, salty, and rich in nutrients. Such blooms release a huge amount of different toxins. In Texas, red tides used to happen once in a decade. Now they occur every three years. In Florida, red algal blooms appear every year. Long, skinny diatoms can also produce toxic substances harmful to people. Even worse, if some shellfish, like razor clams, eat a lot of this plankton, they become toxic too. 
That's why cooking them for dinner can lead to a disaster. It's one of the reasons why marine waters are usually monitored. If toxin levels become too high, beaches get closed for shellfish harvesting. Harmful algal blooms can last for several days to a couple of months. They rid the water of oxygen, causing marine life to disappear. But it gets even worse when microbes start to decompose the algae at the end of the bloom. They consume even more oxygen in the process, and no fish can survive it. This creates huge areas of water almost totally devoid of oxygen and any kind of plant or animal life. Harmful algal blooms appear in the regions with too many nutrients in the water. And the most common of these nutrients comes from agriculture and other industries. Plus, winter monsoons have become warmer and now carry more moisture. This allows algae to gather in huge blooms. Some of them get so gigantic that the thick green swirls can be seen from space. Not all algal blooms are harmful, though. Some of them just add a terrible taste to the water, change its color, or produce revolting smells. Unfortunately, you won't be able to tell toxic algae from totally harmless kinds, judging only by their appearance. Algae aren't the only organisms that look deceitfully harmless. Here are other marine inhabitants you should never ever touch. The Arukanji jellyfish, found in Australia, looks tiny and totally innocent. But appearances are deceitful, and this baby, the size of a human thumbnail, is actually lethal. During stinger season, which lasts from November to May, tons of beaches get closed because of these itsy-bitsy creatures. What makes the jellyfish particularly dangerous is their miniature size. You will simply fail to notice one while swimming. Oops. The blue-ringed octopus looks not just harmless, it's breathtakingly beautiful. But don't let the looks fool you. You wouldn't want to disturb this relatively small 8-inch long creature. It carries enough venom to bring down 26 adults within mere minutes. And once the animal feels threatened, well, you can probably guess the outcome. At the same time, when left alone, the octopus is absolutely docile. The infamous box jellyfish, named for its cubic body shape, lives in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Stay clear from a creature with a squarish bell and long dangling tentacles. And even if you see only a single tentacle, without the jellyfish attached to it, don't come close or touch it. The box jellyfish can grow up to 10 feet, and each of its tentacles has about 500,000 microscopic harpoons to inject venom. Unlike other jellyfish, box jellyfish are hunters. They can latch onto you by wrapping their slender tentacles around your limb or body. With how dangerous their venom is, it won't be a pleasant experience. The crown of thorn starfish got its name because of the venomous spines covering its entire body. The second largest starfish in the world, it can grow up to 20 inches across. They feed on corals, and they eat a lot. Just one hungry starfish can finish off more than 100 square feet of corals within a year. The creatures also tend to have loads of babies. They produce more than 500 million eggs at a time. Really, an overachiever. The fairly small blue-spotted ribbon-tail ray mostly lives in the tropical Indian and western Pacific Oceans, near coral reefs. No more than 14 inches across, the creature has a striking color pattern. It's yellow with electric blue spots on its body and several blue stripes on its tail. But however pretty this animal is, keep in mind that it's also dangerous. It can injure you with venomous tail spines. You can come across lionfish in the South Pacific Ocean and in the Caribbean Sea. Despite what most people think, it's okay to cook these fish. These creatures present real danger when they are alive. You can get accidentally stung by their needle-sharp fins that contain venom. If you're an enthusiastic shell collector, you should know the cone snail by sight. About 4 inches long, the snail looks cute and innocent. But this look is deceitful, especially if you're dealing with a tropical species. Imagine finding a pretty shell and picking it up. You aren't afraid. Your diving gloves seem to offer perfect protection. But cone snails have tiny needle-like protrusions they can deploy from their mouths. And those are full of lethal neurotoxins. These harpoons can easily get through your diving suit's fabric. But the worst thing is that the venom contains painkillers. You won't even know you've been stung. The flower urchin got to the Guinness Book of Records as the most dangerous sea urchin on the planet. These creatures live in the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans. 
And while a flower urchin may look like something you'd love to see in your aquarium, never ever touch it. Flower urchins have enough venom to make your holiday extremely unpleasant. Or short. The reef stonefish, the world's most venomous fish, knows how to camouflage. Oh goody. It can blend into the surroundings so well, you won't even notice it even if you're paying attention. This makes it all too easy to step on the fish. Once the creature feels threatened, like when you're accidentally trying to crush it, it extends the venomous spines growing along its back. The more pressure, the more venom the fish produces. The creature remains dangerous even taken out of the water. The Indonesian needlefish isn't venomous, doesn't have sharp teeth, and will most likely stay as far away from you as possible. The danger lies in the fish's body shape. After all, it wasn't called the needle for nothing. Needlefish swim near the surface. In case of danger, they launch themselves out of the water, and their speed can reach 37 miles per hour. Their long, sharp jaws turn the fish into flying spears. The striped surgeon fish got its name because of the spines growing near the base of its tail. When the fish feels in danger, it moves the tail and reveals these scalpel-shaped spines. If you don't hurry to move away, you can get several nasty cuts. Keep in mind that some species are also venomous. Hey, have a nice day at the beach, y'all! You're walking along the riverbank. It's quiet, save for the water's peaceful burbling. The hot Georgia sun beats down on your neck. That's when you notice something strange on the ground. Looks like a quarter-sized black coin with a weird pattern on it. You bend over for a closer look. Is it a coin? This thing looks like an ancient seal with a symbol carved in it. It's probably from some long-lost civilization. You could sell it and make a fortune. You crouch down on one knee to pick up your newfound treasure. As soon as your finger touches it, you pull your hand back as fear wells in your gut. It's hairy. You go to pick it up again, digging your nails in the dirt around it to pull it out of the ground. That's when it moves. Your heart jumps in your throat. It's pounding so hard you can feel it in your head. The fear turns to horror when the coin wiggles its way out of the ground. It's no ancient treasure. It's a huge spider! A ravine trapdoor spider, to be precise. This hard, coin-looking growth on the back of its body serves as a shield. The eight-legged terrors burrow into the ground and plug it like a cork so hungry enemies can't get to them. Or, you know, giant confused humans like you. This spider is venomous, but its bite isn't toxic to humans. Who, lucky you! But I didn't say you wouldn't feel it. Best stay away from those sizable pincer-like fangs. Ow! Well, so much for your riches. Perhaps fortune awaits you in Mexico's Baja California Peninsula. You're walking on dried-up ground when you notice a long white stripe up ahead. You get closer. Oh, looks like a super long worm, you think to yourself. But it doesn't move like any worm you've ever seen. That's when you see it has arms and a head. This pale creature with black beady eyes is a Mexican mole lizard. It lives in the ground where all its dinner of insects and termites hang out. It rarely comes out, so you're pretty lucky to have seen this bizarre reptile. Now you're in a rainforest in northeastern Australia. Ahead, half hidden among the trees, you notice something large and round. This mysterious figure lying on the ground is covered in black hair. At first, you think it's a bear curled up sleeping. But that wouldn't make any sense. There are no bears down under. You're getting closer when a twig snaps under your foot. The thing hears you and springs to its legs. It turns to you, and you now see this is a bizarre and beautiful bird. That black hair is actually a thick coat of long, fine feathers. This formidable fowl has a bright blue head with a large horn on top. It stands on two powerful legs with a dagger-like claw on each foot that can be as long as your hand. Take away those feathers and you might mistake this thing for a velociraptor. But it's actually a cassowary, the most dangerous bird in the world. It could jump straight over your head if it wanted to, definitely high enough to kick you in the chest. And its blows are strong enough to break bone, not to mention that claw that can cut through anything like butter. 
this bird was made to hunt and avoid being hunted. Don't even consider running away. Not unless you too can sprint over 30 miles per hour. Diving into that lake over there won't save you either. This bird is an excellent swimmer. Best just to back away slowly and hope it doesn't come after you. Another creature that proves it's best to keep your hands to yourself is the panda ant. The naming is obvious. It's black and white and furry like the beloved bamboo-chewing bear. This furry little bugger lives in the forests of Chile. But don't go to pet this fluffy little ant. What you're looking at is no ant at all. It's a species of wasp. That black and white coloring serves one purpose, to warn others of this insect's powerful sting. And if that doesn't make you back away, the wasp will let out a squeaking sound. It sounds cute to us humans, but it means a painful sting is around the corner. These insects are loners, they don't live in colonies, and don't have nests. They're also parasites. A female panda ant lays eggs next to the larvae of another insect. Then, the hatched babies use these larvae as food. Surely you've seen bugs that look like leaves and twigs. But what about a creature that looks like a beautiful orchid? You can find this fragrant flower in the forest or a green field among other plants. But make sure that's a flower you're leaning in toward to smell. If it's not, you risk being bitten by a praying mantis. The orchid mantis is nearly impossible to distinguish among the flowers. It has pink-white coloring with legs and claws that look identical to little petals. It uses its resemblance to the plant to hide from predators and hunt insects that love these flowers. A butterfly or a bee flies up to the flower when one of the petals starts moving. The unsuspecting meal might take it as simply the wind. But then the petal turns into a sharp claw that suddenly grabs the insect. Now imagine you're in the jungles of Costa Rica. You notice a brown snake sitting on a tree branch in front of your face. The snake looks like it's about to strike. Well, you want to run away as far as possible, but notice that this snake is unusually short, and it doesn't lash out at you. You wait, but the snake keeps staring at you. It doesn't even hiss. <laughs> Lucky for you, it'll never bite because it's not a snake, but a caterpillar. The hawk moth caterpillar can change the shape of its body to look like a menacing serpent. This easily scares away any hungry foes. The coloring and pattern on the skin imitates a snake's scales and eyes. This insect also knows how to move like a reptile. A master of disguise, this one! Let's get out of the hot jungle and head to Central Europe. You're in the middle of a sunny green meadow. Colorful flowers bloom around. Birds sing and bees buzz by. Among the bees, some are not what they seem. You'd hardly be able to distinguish the imposters. But if you look really closely, you'll see the golden bee fly moving through the air. It looks like a bumblebee, but it's the buzzer's biggest enemy. The golden bee fly sneaks into bee nests and lays eggs there. Its larvae hatch and feed on the bees and flower nectar. The yellow and black coloring allows the intruder to go undetected the whole time. The camouflage also keeps enemies away. Nothing would touch this fly if it thinks it'll get a bumblebee sting. The next spot on your journey is the rainforest in southern Thailand. Now, be extra careful and watch your step. Not because the next animal is poisonous or bites, but because you might actually step on it. The leaves from the trees have fallen and turned a gray-brown hue. Among these leaves, it's tough to distinguish the Malaysian horned leaf frog. Its body shape, coloring, and especially those pointy growths coming out above its eyes all allow this amphibian to hide perfectly among the fallen foliage. This frog can sit for hours in one place, waiting for its next meal to come close enough to… Now you're in a garden. You see a beautiful, bright flower and a small bird hovering near it. The bird flaps its wings so quickly you can hardly see them. And that long, needle-like beak makes you immediately assume you're looking at a hummingbird. But as soon as you get closer, you realize this is not a bird, but an insect. Fortunately, the hummingbird hawk moth isn't venomous and doesn't sting. It's just a lovely little creature that decorates the garden with its presence. 
Many people even grow plants rich in nectar to attract these moths. Hey, that's an idea! Now, if for some reason you ever, you know, decide to wake up a sleeping giant panda or cuddle it, just remember, that's a bad idea. Even fearless big cats like snow leopards are wary of bothering pandas in the wild. The ones you see in the zoo might not be that active, but they still have a massive jaw that can deliver a powerful bite. Their huge false thumb lets them get a good grip on their enemies. The most misleading thing about the leopard seal is its mouth, which always appears to be smiling. But they're actually rather aggressive animals and effective lone hunters. They like to play cat and mouse with their food, which includes penguins, fish, squid, and even smaller seals. Not so long ago, a leopard seal even dragged a marine biologist deep underwater. Hey, stop playing with your food! Ant eaters feed on insects, citrus fruit, and avocados. Watch out! They have no teeth, poor vision, and bad hearing. Sounds kind of like my Uncle Rudy. They aren't aggressive and stay away from people. But if humans walk on their trails, ant eaters can turn fierce and may fight. They get on their hind legs, use their tails for balance, and attack with their claws that are strong enough to hurt a jaguar or a land rover. Fluffy alpacas may seem warm-hearted, but they still have ways of defending themselves. They can spit up to 10 feet, and you don't want that stuff getting in your eyes because it contains stomach acid, along with chewed-up grass. They can bite with their sharp fighting teeth that are at the back of their mouths, and they have soft toes to give enemies a good kick. They can't really do more damage than you might get in a fight with a child, but it's best not to upset them. There are three things that brings out the nasty side of a Tasmanian devil. When there's a predator nearby, when they're competing for a mate, and when they're protecting their meal. Also Bugs Bunny, but that's a cartoon. These guys normally feed on insects, birds, frogs, and fish, and they like scavenging more than hunting. But if you intrude upon their home for any reason, be prepared for a painful bite. Their teeth are strong enough to eat through bones. Elephants are so clever that they understand the feelings of other elephants, and they even try to help each other. They can also take revenge on people who upset them. Elephants sometimes block roads and show up in the villages of people who have been mean to them. Male elephants get especially aggressive when fighting over females. Watch out for those huge feet, they can really do some damage. Better pack your trunk! Puffer fish can inflate to several times their normal size to protect themselves against predators. Hey, my brother-in-law can do that too. Eh, just kidding. Most animals shouldn't try eating them anyways. There's enough poison inside them to finish off 30 people, and there's no antidote. So, if it's just you, you'll need to invite some friends along to spread out the poison. Nah, I just made that up. Swans tend to see humans as the biggest danger to their homes and families. Male swans get especially aggressive during the spring nesting season from April to June. When kayakers, rowers, or anglers get too close to their nests, swans start hissing and flapping their wings. If you don't pay attention to these warning signs, the swan might even try to flip your boat over. Dolphins are the only species on the planet, apart from humans, that can take another creature's life for no logical reason. Males sometimes attack female dolphins or even baby ones, and they don't do it for food. If an angry dolphin chases you, you have no chance of outswimming it. They can move at 22 miles per hour. The top speed of Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps is only 6 miles per hour, so he can't help you. Slow lorises are the only venomous primates in the world. They carry poison in their elbows. It's transferred to their mouths during grooming to protect their babies. Plus, they scare off predators like pythons and eagle hawks using special markings that show how fearsome they are. If a slow loris bites a person who ends up on its territory or annoys it, the result can be rashes, anaphylactic shock, or, you know, even worse. Despite their massive weight and clumsy bodies, hippos can run much faster than people. And they have much sharper teeth. If you get in their way on their trip to the watering hole, their aggression kicks in. Before they attack you, though, they'll give you some warning signs. If you see a hippo yawn, 
or make a sound like a laugh, it means it's about to get mad. Well, that's rather confusing, isn't it? Blue-ringed octopuses are really tiny, but their venom is a thousand times stronger than cyanide. They normally use it to hunt shrimp, crabs, and small fish. If this creature feels threatened, it'll flash its blue rings as a warning. If you don't pay attention, it may bite you. You might not notice the bite itself, but minutes later, you'll definitely notice the symptoms. Nausea, numbness, and even the loss of your senses and motor skills. So pay attention down there. Geographic cone snails are a seriously dangerous critter. They puncture their victims with a tooth that's like a harpoon, and then inject their venom. If a small cone attacks you, it'll just feel like a bee sting. If you're unlucky enough to meet a larger one, though, it could cause numbing, swelling, muscle paralysis, changes to your vision, and even breathing difficulties. Canada geese have been living close to humans for years, but they're still wary of us getting near their homes, especially during the spring mating season. At this time, the male geese can chase and bite people that seem like a threat to their mates, eggs, or babies. If you want to avoid being attacked by this seriously angry bird, the best thing you can do is just slowly back away. Squirrels have a lot of enemies, both in the wild and in cities. Their superpower against all of them is their speed and agility. Most of the time, it's completely safe to go near them. But they can still be unpredictable like any wild animal. They go on biting sprees occasionally. And watch out, they carry infections like rabies. They're more likely to go after your pets or kids, but they can also bite adults. So, to play it safe, always walk behind your pets or kids to use them as decoys. Of course I'm kidding. If you ever see a kangaroo get up on its hind legs, back off. This is their way of warning you that they think you're a threat to their females or their food. They are real pros at boxing with each other, and they have really long legs and sharp claws. Kangaroos jump into the air to give extra force to their kicks, which are powerful enough to break bones. A platypus doesn't have teeth, and it mainly eats insects and shellfish. It's one of only two mammals that lay eggs. But these strange things can still do you harm. Male platypuses have sharp spurs hidden on the heels of their hind feet. There's venom in these spurs that's strong enough to take down a dog. Koalas get most of their hydration from eating eucalyptus leaves, and they get all the protection they need from their sharp teeth and claws. When a koala scratches someone that wants to cuddle them a little too hard, they can pass on some unpleasant infections. <laughs> Raccoons can easily adapt to any environment, including your backyard. They rarely attack humans directly, but can damage your property and make you sick. They'll go anywhere to get some food, from trash cans to bird nests. And this is where they can catch a lot of different infections. Apart from disease, raccoons can give humans nasty wounds that take a long time to heal. When it thinks you're threatening its dam, a beaver will start slapping the water with its tail as a warning sign. If you ignore it, it'll try to use its sharp teeth against you to protect its family. So, it's better to just leave it to beaver. Hey, there's a special knife you can use to protect yourself against attack called a beaver cleaver. No wait, that's an old TV show. Otters spend a lot of their time swimming on their backs, and they don't care about cleaning up after themselves. That's why they leave behind bits of fish that attract insects carrying diseases. Apart from being so messy, they also have powerful teeth that can be used against any unwanted visitor. Cassowaries are the most dangerous birds on the planet. One of these can weigh as much as an adult person, and it has long, powerful legs and sharp claws. They can chase after you at 30 miles per hour. Luckily enough, they try to avoid fights. But if you don't want to be the target of their karate moves, keep a safe distance and don't provoke them. Got that? Good. Uh, it's a rainy Thursday evening and you curl up in your armchair with a cup of hot chocolate and a new bright side video. Suddenly, you notice a scary shadow above you. There's a monster on the wall with 100 legs and antenna on its head. You start dialing 911 and your mom at the same time. 
While you're on the phone, your guest moves at lightning speed. Two seconds, and you can no longer see it. You grab a mop and hide in your closet. With your hand shaking, you open the browser and type scary beast inside my house. You scroll before you finally find the right one. House centipede. Turns out it only has 15 pairs of legs, two well-developed eyes, and two long, sensitive antennae to pick up smells and vibrations. It carries venom in the legs located by the head and near the mouth. And it can hold more than one prey in its legs using them like a lasso. All this makes your guest an excellent hunter. Somehow, all the web pages you're looking at are telling you to leave the beast alone and be happy it's in your house. A lot of people are trying to get rid of them. But house centipedes are a natural and free pest control in your home. They'll help you get rid of bugs, flies, ants, moths, spiders, termites, and cockroaches. You, as a human, are simply not on their menu. They're active night hunters, and they don't leave webs or traps anywhere. They don't build nests in house either, and don't snack on your furniture, clothing, food, or pets. They move without making a sound and without leaving any dirty traces behind. House centipedes don't carry any diseases and in 99% of cases, get out at night when you can't see them. They're always moving around looking for prey. Because they move quickly, you might not notice them at all. They would only try biting you if you attack them first. Even then, they can't bite through skin. It feels like a light bee sting. Nah, nothing too crazy. This sounds promising, and you're almost ready to get out of your hiding spot. Ah! You scream like a girl. It's there again. Quickly, you don't need to feel comfortable sharing your home with this multi-legged creature. You grab a jar and a paper. It's running across the room. It's under the bookshelf. Wait for it to get out on the wall. You turn off the lights to make it feel more relaxed. It's still now. And so, it's done! You take it outside and hope it will still do the pest control job out there. You decide to secure the house from any other unwanted guests. So, house centipedes love moisture and like to hang out in bathrooms and basements most of all. You get downstairs and fill all the gaps in the floor and the walls. You check all the pipes in the bathroom and kitchen for leaks. Ah, perfect! Now it's time to go outside and remove dry leaves and twigs. Centipedes love to hide in there. It's been a busy night. You decide to watch some TV. Ouch! What a monster! It's a Goliath bird eater, the largest spider in the world. And just like the house centipede, it looks way scarier than it actually is. The Goliath diet includes insects, frogs, and rodents. It lives in northern South America. Despite its huge size, it can't hurt a human with its venom, no more than a bee sting. The next guest on the show is the whale shark, obviously not a bug. It's the largest shark and fish in the world, slightly bigger than a double-decker bus and as heavy as five elephants. They have 300 tiny teeth in their mouth, and they use those on plankton and the occasional fish. Whale sharks are slow swimmers and the kindest of all sharks. They even play with divers. In fact, humans are more dangerous to them than they are to humans. Despite its huge size, giant African millipede is a shy guy and would rather hide under the rocks all day. The only thing it can attack is dry leaves on the ground. This way, it plays its role for the environment. Australian thorny dragons are lizards with scary-looking spikes on their bodies. They move around the scrubs and deserts in search of ants. That's their favorite and only meal, and they can eat thousands of small ants a day. They catch them with their sticky tongues. Thorny dragons use their spikes to protect themselves against predators and won't ever attack a human. Their superpower is changing color depending on temperature. Wrinkle-faced bats live in Central and South America. They only eat fruit, and their face shape and skin helps them with it. They have terrible table manners and shove their face completely in their lunch. All the wrinkles help the fruit juices funnel directly into the mouth. Oh, what a great idea! I should try that! I.I.s are lemurs that live only in Madagascar. An old local superstition says meeting one of those is really bad luck. In fact, they're harmless creatures that feed on insects and larvae. They quickly tap on tree trunks to find food and take it out with their long middle fingers. I.I.s prefer to stay on trees and barely get down on the ground, so you're unlikely to ever bump into one anyway. 
If you ever visit Nepal or India and run into a crocodile with a long and narrow nose, don't panic, it's a gerial. Crocodiles are their closest relatives, but gerials are not one of them. They are their own unique species. Their weird noses are perfectly adapted to catch fish. It's their favorite food. Gerials are loving and caring parents and super shy creatures. They hide from humans and never attack them. Milk snakes look almost exactly like coral snakes. But unlike that highly venomous creature, they are completely harmless. Nature gave them those brightly colored stripes to trick prospective predators into thinking they are coral snakes. Thanks to that mimicry, they survive in different places from fields and rocks to agricultural areas and barns. Some people even keep milk snakes as pets. Yeah, but you better keep the different color patterns straight. Matamata spiky turtles are super lazy. They don't even swim, but walk in slow-moving streams and swamps. They only get out of the water to lay eggs. Matamatas don't hunt, but wait for their food to come by. When they see a fish, they stretch their neck and swallow it like a vacuum cleaner. They have to do it because their jaws can't even chew. Hey, what's the motto with you? Virginia tiger moth is as scared of you as you are of it and tries to avoid contact at all costs. Their favorite food is leaves, birch, willow, maple, walnut, cabbage, and so on. They chew on the fleshy parts and leave the leafy skeleton behind. If you really annoy them, they'll try to protect themselves. But the most serious mark they can leave behind is slight skin irritation. Or some nunchuck marks if they're forced to use their martial arts. Eh, just kidding. Vultures have sharp beaks and talons and a reputation as a bad guy. In fact, they won't hurt a single living being. Their culinary preference is animal carcasses. Yum! This way, they make the world a cleaner and healthier place, kind of like animal control. Unlike most birds that have 360-degree vision, vultures only focus on what's going on beneath them with their 60-degree vision. Giant isopods are close relatives of shrimps and crabs living deep under the sea. They have alien-like bodies with dozens of sharp claws on the belly and four sets of jaws to hunt. But they don't always have food around them. That's why they slow down their metabolism to save energy and constantly live in semi-hibernation. When they're in danger, giant isopods curl up into a little ball and hide so that no one can find them. The star-nosed mole is the size of a hamster and the fastest eater in the world. It presses the creepy-looking star on its nose to the soil to find out what's in 10 to 12 different places in a second. The star has 100,000 nerve fibers in it that send information to the mole's brain. Not a bad compensation for almost no eyesight and good enough to hunt insects while being perfectly harmless to humans. Tailless whip scorpions, unlike their relatives, don't carry venom or toxins and can't bite, sting, or hurt humans in any other possible way. They can't even chew, so they sit and wait for an insect to pass by and detect it with their legs. They make great pets, and owners even put them on their faces without fear. Mm-hmm. That's okay, you go first. I'll, uh, watch from over here. Boom! This word isn't nearly enough to illustrate the explosion, the most powerful one you've ever seen. And what's most important, it's a lake that's just blown up. Hey, all you wanted to do is light up some fireworks in this picturesque place. But you must have totally missed the danger strictly no fire warning sign along the way. And now, the wall of fuming water is quickly closing in on you. But first, let's rewind to the beginning of the whole thing. You're in Alberta, Canada, and have just arrived to Abraham Lake for a hike of your life. The lake is frozen, and the view is awesome. Those bubbles under the ice look like hundreds of frozen jellyfish. In reality, they're made of methane, a toxic and highly flammable gas produced by bacteria living on the bottom of the lake. That's why the sign is there. If you so much as light a match on this ice, it might set the whole thing on fire. Luckily, you've taken note of it on the way here and put away the fireworks you wanted to light up. Another place, another time. Another lake. This one's not frozen. In fact, it probably hasn't seen a winter since the last ice age. We're in Cameroon now, and the place is called Lake Nios. It looks peaceful, but make no mistake, 
its orange-brown waters hide a deadly secret. The lake rests atop a highly volatile area, and the fissures in its bottom let out massive amounts of carbon dioxide. When the ground shifts, this gas spills out of the lake and flows miles around it. The concentrations are so high that one breath of it would make you faint, and you'd have zero chance of waking up. Eh, you get the picture. But the most sinister thing about it is that the CO2 doesn't have a smell or color, so you wouldn't even see it coming. Local authorities have set up a system of pipes that drains the gas from the lake, making it mm, relatively safe for people and animals in the vicinity. And another toxic lake, Kivu, on the border of Congo and Rwanda, has even been made to provide energy for millions of people thanks to its gases. While we're in Africa, the Danakil Depression in Ethiopia is also worth a blood-curdling visit. Dubbed the hottest place on Earth, it sure lives up to its name. The ravine is peppered with extremely hot springs, toxic acid ponds, and active volcanoes. The landscape is surreal, to say the least, and is probably the only inhabited place on Earth where no life can exist. The Afar people live here all year round and gather salt around the springs for trade, while scientists couldn't find any evidence of microbial life in those. Humans are notorious for settling in places most would gladly avoid. Take Mount Tambora in Indonesia. Thousands of people have been living on and around its slopes for centuries until the fateful day in 1815. Tambora is a volcano, and that year it decided to erupt, resulting in a blast that obliterated everything on the island and was heard almost a thousand miles away. It spewed out so much volcanic ash that it fell in sheets on the surrounding isles and caused a year without a summer in the whole northern hemisphere. It was the most powerful eruption in the last 10,000 years, and Mount Tambora became as much as 5,000 feet lower after it. But back to our time. There's an island you won't be allowed to visit, but I bet you wouldn't want to anyway. The Snake Island in Brazil is home to thousands of snakes, as its name implies. The moment you step on its soil, you're in grave danger of being bitten by a viper. The island is also the only place you can meet a golden lancehead viper. The encounter of a lifetime, literally. This place is so dangerous that Brazil has banned tourists and any other visitors from it unconditionally. Okay, gotta go! Now, get your warmest clothes on and don't forget a fur face mask. We're going to Omayakin, Russia. It's a small town in the far north that's often called the coldest place on the planet where people still live. The only place with a lower average temperature is Antarctica, and that's saying something. In the winter, if you so much as forget to put on a sweater, another sweater, another sweater, and a fur coat, you'll get frozen to the bone in mere seconds. Temperatures here drop to the chilling minus 96 degrees Fahrenheit. Fresh fruit turns to chunks of ice in minutes and becomes so hard you could drive nails into wood with an apple here. Now, before you freeze in place, let's go somewhere no boat will take you. The skeleton coast in Namibia. No, really, you can only drive or fly in here because boats and ships won't go near the place. The waters are treacherous. Sudden gales toss vessels around, and sharp rocks hiding underwater are all too happy to ram into their hulls. The coast itself stretches for hundreds of miles and is divided into southern and northern parts. Visitors on all-terrain vehicles are allowed freely into the southern part, but only about 800 people a year can get to the northern one and only with guided tours. People are known to have been lost in this desert forever, and it's a daunting place to go. It got its name from numerous animal carcasses found here. Hmm. Still, about 50,000 indigenous people managed to survive in this place along with adapted animals, lizards, hyenas, and even elephants. Now, you'd expect a living destruction 